philosopher, historian, author, professor emeritus at Hunter College in New York. He has two new books on the press. They are New Dimensions of African History, published by African World Press in Trenton, New Jersey, African People and World History, published by the Black Classic Press in Baltimore, Maryland, and he's just completed a book, The Africans at the Crossroads, Notes for an African Revolution. Dr. Clark has had an interest in African history all his life. He currently lives in Harlem among his people. We, as Robot Wonders, is going to continue this lecture series. We're having another event in, in March. It will be given at the church. The church is Worldwide Wonders. The address is 2053 West 63rd Street in Chicago, Illinois. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over the years, I have lectured many times on the subject of Malcolm X and his relationship to the black radical ministry throughout the world. I have exhausted any fight I have with anyone over the subject because I've had enough time to think it out well and to reconsider anything I said initially. In other words, I've had time to go over my mental notes on the subject enough to be settled in my mind. Malcolm X's relationship to the radical ministry of the African world. I am dealing with the antecedents of Malcolm X, and to deal with the antecedents of Malcolm X, you've got to deal with the antecedents of radicalism in the African world. You have to understand that we are a radical revolutionary people, and that we were not a radical revolutionary people, we would not still been, be in existence. At another place, I have said, Malcolm X, who had three distinct identifications, Malcolm Little, Malcolm X, and Malcolm El Hajj Shabazz, lived three distinct lives, and yet all of these lives stem from one life. I've also said that no nation could have made Malcolm quite the way he is, he, were, he was, and no nation could have destroyed him with the same ruthless uniqueness that he is a product of American oppression, and that no nation oppressed quite the same way the United States oppressed, and no nation destroys its oppressed quite the same way. That we're dealing with a unique phenomenon in history, and yet, when we address ourselves as Malcolm X, relationship, to radicalism and to radical social thought and radical action among African people, we are dealing with a personality that we have met many times on the roads of our history. So therefore, there is nothing specially new about the spirit of Malcolm X. There's not, nothing especially new about the action of Malcolm X. He is unique for his time and the other radicals were unique for their time. I am not saying that he is 
a duplication. I'm saying he is he was a continuation of radical thinking and radical history, and radical acting that is deep in our history as a people. And one of the reasons we do not know that is because too many times our minds get locked behind what is called the 500-year room by Professor Van Sertima. And I say our mind gets locked in front of a slavery curtain, and we act as though slavery was the only thing of consequence that has happened to us. Slavery, in the measurement of time, because we are the oldest people functioning on this earth. We were functioning four million years ago. And when we look at the societies we have produced, 500 years out of that time is one half of the wink of an eye. All right. So you're talking about, you hung up with slavery. You haven't even studied what you did a thousand years before slavery. And what did you do a thousand years before that? And a thousand years before that, I'm saying that we must take a holistic and a global view of black radicalism and show that a Malcolm X fits into that category historically. And he is a continuation or radical activity among African people that started with the beginning of organized societies in the Nile Valley and in, in Southeast Africa. He is a continuation of a people who were on the stage of the world for thousands of years with no script and had to act out and make real a play of history with no precedent. They had to do this because there was nothing for them to follow. There was no previous people. Nobody left any books behind. There wasn't nobody to leave these books behind. They had to start from scratch and build human society. They had to start from scratch and build spirituality and that all of our action of survival has been radical activity leading ultimately to the radical class of the Malcolm X. I am saying that our social thinking in the ancient world, when we look down the spectrum of our history and take it in full view, we must consider the fact that we built enduring society that lasted for thousands of years, not only without a jail system, but without a word in our language that meant jail. That if we could do this through the family structure and the community structure, it means that we had a radical way of looking at the world, original and an imaginative way of looking at the world that we still need, and that the world still needs. And I'm saying that transform the river valleys of Africa into cities and civilization was a radical activity in the world, because all of this existed before the first European wore a shoe or lived in a house that had a window. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that with the coming of foreigners, a new kind of radical had to come into being. And the main reasons why we have not understood a Malcolm X in relationship to the uniqueness of oppression in the United States and the uniqueness of destruction of oppressors, oppression, oppressors in the, the oppressed in the United States, that we have not understood the design 
of the nation itself. We have not understood that while we had a humanity that spoke to all human beings, the foreigner had a humanity that was parochial that spoke to his intention of holding power. And that to tell a lie was an easy thing for him to do because in matters pertaining to the recognition of other people's humanity, he didn't mean it in the first place. He didn't mean arguments about democracy in the first place. He didn't mean about Christianity in the first place. Because his method of holding power is both anti-democratic and anti-Christian. Right. In the one disaster that would hit his life, if he dared to practice Christianity or democracy 24 hours, he spent it. <laughs> so the one thing you can depend on the Europeans never to believe and never to practice is democracy and Christianity. Because if he will dismantle his entire society by virtue of this kind of commitment. So from the beginning, you are dealing with a liar who the lie is part of his tradition and part of his history. All right, I have simplistically divided the world into three different categories of people, and it is simplistic to the point where many of my students have said, now, Professor Clark, you know that all people are alike, and we have to say, do you hear? You're dead wrong, all people are not alike. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People are shaped by environmental influence, they're shaped by weather, they're shaped by the presence of food, they're shaped by the absence of food. They're shaped by attitudes that bred them into, into their society. Right now, let's deal with this early African for all of the years before he knew that there was anything in the world called a European. Most of our radical activity had to be developed in trying to get this white monkey off of our back. Because <laughs> we got one kind of radicalism in building a new society without precedent. Without precedent, we had to develop another kind of radicalism to deal with the infusion and the coming into our society of people whose word could not be taken, people who did not respect our culture, did not respect our women, did not respect our family structure. So a special kind of radical had to be introduced to deal with this kind of invader. Now, in the United States, a radical had to be special again based on the design of the country, the intention of the country. Because this country was designed for free white Protestant males, middle class and up, those who agreed with the prevailing political status quo and who owned property. Everybody else was out, including white women. Now, you have the illusion that the state started off democratically when it started off not addressing itself to the major issue. Excuse me, what happened to the war? First. The major issue of facing the country at the time was slavery. And this, this uh, event made it a necessity to create another form of radicalism led by Frederick Douglass in the 19th century. My main point is to hook up Malcolm X with his intellectual and revolutionary antecedents. 
in the main revolutionary antecedents of Malcolm X is the black ministry and the black radical of the 19th century who brought us into the 20th century when radicalism began to be watered down and radicalism began to be compromised. Once again, looking at the radicalism of the United States and looking at how this country preserves itself every time a member of an oppressed group, especially black, showed his people the face of power and what to do about it, he was either murdered, driven into exile, or driven to suicide. There is no exception. So any time any African person shows his people in this country the true face of power and what to do about it, guard him 24 hours a day and have someone watching the guards for fear they may not be on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because sooner or later, one of three things is going to have to happen to him unless you're on guard to prevent it. He's going to be assassinated, or he's going to be driven into exile, or he's going to be driven to suicide. Now, had you known this pattern in American history that goes all the way back while we are concerned, and had you begin to investigate the mysterious death of David Walker after his appeal, the mysterious death of Booker T. Washington, after the last four years of his life, he stopped catering to whites and began to raise some principal questions about the whites, even whites who gave him money. Then he was gone. And all the other, Monroe Trotter, supposed to fall off the roof of a house where he lived and where he was born and where he'd been walking, where he, where he walked around as a child and knew every spot on that roof. Now, who in the hell would fall off a roof they knew that well? <laughs> Yep. Then we understand that Martin Luther King was saved so long as he as he advocated nonviolence. But when he raised some principal questions about power, he was on a collision course with those who murder everyone who raises that question and shows his people the true face of power. My point is that Malcolm X not only relate to this 19th century radicalism, that he related to the 19th century radicalism in the African world and the radicalism in the Caribbean world, and that there was a period when the radicalism of the Caribbean world affected the intellectual wedding between themselves and that and those in the United States and became one, predating Pan-Africanism by a hundred years before anyone began to use the name Pan-Africanism. But now, going back in history again, looking at the radical factor in our history, I have said that we had Three golden ages. Ages of great prosperity. We had two golden ages before we saw the European. We had another one after the rise of Islam, disrupted by the Arab slave trade, but we had it in spite of the Arab slave trade that most of the brothers in fact, all of the brothers don't even want to talk about. <laughs> That's right. yeah. Now, how is it, and what kind of people are you to have had three golden ages, and you might have a fourth one, when there are people who've lived and died without having one? 
what's so special about you. And what I'm trying to point to is what is special about you is your ability to produce radicals who affect social change and who challenge the status quo to the point where they can bring about social change. And this radicalism started early in our history as a people. Now, we began to challenge the norm. We began to make changes and innovations in society that ultimately would change all society. Now, during the dynastic period in Egypt, the first dynasty, impressive, with no more Amina. The second, kind of a holding dynasty, housekeeping dynasty. I mean, they didn't need, they did not move backward or forward. The third dynasty we would produce, not only a great radical, but the world's first multi-genius who would make radical changes in the society itself. M Hotel. Bill of the Step Pyramid. Doctor, the world's first physician, who lived 2,000 years before the Greek who's called the world's first physician. And if you read the Greek who's called the first world's first physician, he said, I am a child of Imhotep. Mm -hmm. In other words, I am beholden to the African who is the real father of medicine. And yet, the Europeans insist on calling him the father of medicine and take an oath in his name when he, in his writing, told you, told them, I am a child of M. Hotel, the Abraham. Now, my point is that M. Hotel, in building the step pyramid, would set in motion massive building and starting the concept of medicine and beginning the first man to have perform an operation and gathering intellects around him, setting in motion the Egyptian mysteries and ultimately the great large at Luxor that the Arabs called Luxor, the Greeks called Thebes, the Africans called Warat. That he began the concept that would lead ultimately thousands of years later to the concept of higher education. And that men began to gather and to talk about social change and social preservation. And they began to prepare leadership so well that the nation was never without a supply of thinkers. And that this was done with so much uniqueness, you would go into the school to study at the age of seven, seven, you would study 40 years. And most of the time, you would never see a book. And when you come out, you was a physician, an architect, you all, almost anything you needed to do in order to maintain a nation. And you was a principal thinker, a great teacher, and an oracle. And went out to benefit an entire people. I'm saying that this was a radical step forward that got un underway the radical activity that broke into being a nation called Kemet, later to marry, later sites, the Jews called it Mizoram, the Greeks called it Egyptus, that was later abbreviated into Egypt, that the ancient Africans never called their country, Egypt. My main point here is that 
without any precedence. African radicalism was set in motion and social change came into being. Of course, they would write. Many books came into being. Finally, someone brought these paraphrases of these different books. There was a paraphrase plant that out of which came the words for his paper, but that's another lecture. Um, but when it was all pulled together into a single word, the best of it, it was called the Book of the Coming Forth of Day and Night. And because the Arab slave grave robbers were robbing African tombs for manuscripts and gold, whatever they could get, some Arab took this big manuscript out of a tomb and the British who wanted to buy it, asked him where he got it from, and he pointed to the grave he had robbed. He said, I got no dead people over there. They call it the Book of the Dead. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the dead. It had to do with life. Now, in this book, you have literally an anthology, but coming together many books dealing with social thought, social change. Out of this book and from these books, in a collective way, came many of the stories that ultimately went into the making of the Bible, a book that would be lately arrived at in human history. People think the Bible has always been here. It's always true. It's God's word. If man is God, then you, you're right. <laughs> man put it together. And man changed it many times to suit himself. I'm saying it was a great illustration of truth and with lessons taken from Africa by the Hebrews, rehashed, some personified to give you the illusion that they were a part of the event involved. <laughs> Now, we see Africa as the giver. This is something else that the black intellect will not examine. They will not examine with any thoroughness the Hebrew entry for fear of loss of tenure and loss of reputation and loss of limb. <laughs> <laughs> they will not examine in depth the fakery behind and around the faith called Islam, the most unoriginal of all of the forms of religion, because it came into being so fast. It had to steal a few saints from here, a few from here, a few things. It had no original poetry and no original social, social thought. And they don't examine that within a degree because they would have to examine the Arabs who faked it into being. They have to make a clear separation between Islam and Arabism, something the brothers are not willing to do. I'm not saying don't be a Muslim, but I'm saying at what point will they turn their eyes away from the Arabs and focus on great black Muslim thinkers who brought the religion into being all radical. You want to relate Malcolm to radicalism within Islam, then you would relate him to a thinker like Akhmi Barber, who wrote 47 books, each on a separate subject, two books when he was in exile in Morocco. The last of the great chancellors at the University of St. Cory at Timbuktu. Exile in Morocco, he wrote two books trying to explain his people to those silly backward Arabs, and they never got the point then or now. And yet, you know all of the heroes and you can, the litany of the kings of Europe, and most of the blacks who are Muslim never heard 
of the Acne Bar. Never heard of the black radical warriors in the South. Muhammad Ahmed, the Mahdi. Muhammad Abdullah Hassan, called the Mad Mula of Somaliland. These are black Muslims who fought to free their country from any form of domination. The great black Muslims of West Africa, Sekou Toure's grandfather, Sumari, and a Muslim who turned, who created a separate form of Islam. Amadou Bella, the Bumbara. He created an Islam that was basically anti-Arab because he thought they were the corruptors of Islam. This kind of radicalism we have not dealt with. And we have not dealt with the radicalism in the creation of the literature of ancient Egypt and how the Africans arrived at what to do. We have not examined with any thoroughness the works of Sheikh Antadio when in his writings on the history of taboos, he, he showed you that many times Africans arrived at civil law based on what not, what to do, based on what not to do. Now, if you look now at the negative confession, although you are only interested in the 10th commandment part of it, which was which Moses took, if he brought them down from the mountain, he had to take them with him because they were in existence two, three thousand years before he was born. <laughs> Moses, an African prince, born and raised in Africa, born in a place called Goshen, a radical thinker for his day. Now, when he was wanted by the Pharaoh and had to put some space between him and the Hebrews and, and his country, he took up with the Hebrews. Then he in the language of the street, palmed off a deal on them. Obey my God, I'll be your leader. And what did he palm off on them? The concept of monotheism, the concept of the oneness of God as against the multiplicity of God. My point is that he was a radical thinker, but he took his cue from still a radical thinker, more radical than himself. Maybe in religion, the forerunner of radical thinker. Some people said that Akhenaten, who was Amenhotep IV, gave the world monotheism. They're wrong. Some people said that the Hebrews gave the world monotheism. They're still wrong. The Hebrews heard about it wrote about it and personified it and got themselves into the picture. But before their entry into Africa, they had never heard about it. What Akhenaten did is to deal with the corrupt ministry of that day, then restricting the travel of people in the country based on the fact that God had limitations and that your God could only protect you in a given space. And all he did was to give them back what they already had. The fact that God was omnipotent, God was everywhere, God was in everything, and God goes everywhere. My point is that the beginning of African spirituality was a form of radicalism because the Africans gave the world no religion. The Africans gave the world a universal spirituality. Foreigners, <coughs> hypocrites, took 
African spirituality misunderstanding it, converted it into cults and religions and put one against the other and tried to prove that each one of them were the favorites of God. Therefore, saying that God is love and God is merciful and God is kind, then when they said that they were chosen by God, those that they are God's favorite people, they also saying that God has stepchildren <laughs> and God is a baby. If he favored one over the other. My main point is that in this universality of spirituality, God was in everything. God was in all life. God was in all form. If you wanted to pray, you could pray to the wind because God was in the wind. <clears throat> you could pray to the river because God was in the water. You could pray to the tree because God was in the tree. But if God made man in his image and the early Africans understood this, then God was a part of you. And if you turn inward on yourself and examine yourself, self-meditation and self-examination brought you closer to God. That's right. <clears throat> Once the, when the African understood this, he really did not need other people to formulize his spirituality into something called religions and into denomination. It was a radical step forward because no one had ever done that. <coughs> okay, my main point is that this kind of radicalism guided Africa through the first and second golden age. And that Akhenaten came close to the end of the first golden age. And that the recovery of independence and the thousand years of peace and prosperity brought Africa another golden age, and that golden age did not end until farmers came again. You must remember that Africa existed for thousands of years before any invade, invasion, that the first invasion was 1675 BC. My main point is that radicalism within Africa itself expelled the invader and that the third, the second golden age began to peter out when the foreigners came again, not understanding African religion, not respecting African custom, first the Assyrian, 666 BC, then the Iranian, 550 B.C., called, then called the Persian. And they were so brutal that Africans cried out, Oh God, if you cannot send me a liberator, send me a conqueror who will show some mercy. Yeah. Now you can understand why when the little Greek called Alexander, sometimes referred to as the great. <laughs> when he knocked at the door, he didn't have to knock. They are. He was like any other invader. He was a raper. He was a raider of the granary of Egypt to feed his soldiers. But he realized one thing, that Africa was the home of the religions of the Greeks, that African radical activity had brought into being basic religion. And all of this had happened before 
the entry of foreigners. That before the foreigners arrived, Africans had already embarked on a radical course. They had created one of the most intelligent systems known to the world, matrimony. They knew then that if you had a god, you had to have a goddess. While Western man tries to defy nature, African spirituality was to bring man in harmony with nature. And bringing man in harmony with nature, he would bring man in harmony with his relationship to the woman who gave him birth. And because the African had no fear of women, before Alexander arrived, the African had created a system of lineage where the women rode at the head of her army. Women did not come to power just because they were women. They had to wait their turn like anyone else. But when they became head of state, they led their armies in battle other than send them in battle. They engaged in radical activity and social thought and equality. Check out the Duke's little book, The Culture Unity of Black Africa, is very good on this point. In parts of his book, Africa, the Politics of a Federated State, is also good on this point. In his book, Africa, uh, Pre-Colonial, Black Africa is good on this point. But a group of essays he wrote for the Journal of African Civilization, especially his essay, African Contribution to Civilization, The Exact Sciences. This points to African radical activity in the sciences before the European could make a bar of soap. <laughs> what we need to do is to look behind this slavery curtain and see what happened to African people during this period of radical social change. And we need to understand the price Africa paid for internal weakness and how it had to deal with this week. The first invaders coming in 1675 is because an internal weakness developed in Africa, and Africans had to deal with that internal weakness and basically lost some of their independence while making the, the transition. Again, weakness set in and people began to move into Africa again, taking advantage of that weakness. African people have always been the prize to be captured by other people, principally because we are the world's richest people. We have always had and still have things that other people won't, think they can't do without, and don't want to pay for. <laughs> If you understand this, you will understand why the Boers want to hold on to South Africa by any means necessary. Because when they left Europe, they were soiled, religious malcontent, Calvinists. If you understand how the Europeans demean religion, you will understand that the Boers wasn't wanted when they left. And yet, being Calvinists, they belong to a religion that says that they are ordained by God 
to brood over the lesser breed. Mm -hmm. They've declared African lesser breed. This brings me to the 19th century and the examination of radicalism in the 19th century and how this 19th century radicalism relates to the antecedents of the radicalism of Malcolm X. Because his spiritual, intellectual, and religious cousins appeared during this period. People who were ultimately engaged in activities similar to him. And that Malcolm X is the continuation of 19th century radicalism more than any other. He's also, he, he is a continuation of historical radicalism, but he, more directly, he is a descendant of 19th century radicalism. Now, how then did 19th century radicalism come into being? In the British Isles, British controlled Isles, the British had brought basic white technicians to do work, to fix the sugar mill, to do the blacksmithery work. This was a lower class Englishman who had no appreciable status in England because in spite of the need of the craftsmen, there was an English aristocratic class that had no great respect for people who had to earn their living with their hands. He was tolerated because he was needed. But in the West Indies, many of these same people, because the white face was at a premium, because he had a social status in a seat of blackness that he never would have had in England. He began to gamble too much, drink too much, and he began now with all the women, mostly black, he began to say yes to temptation, all those temptations. He began to pursue that temptation. And if you're going to pursue all of the female temptation you meet on the earth, you might as well be more successful and try to drink up all the water in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> it's an impossibility. <laughs> you can wish the rest, wish up on The wish for thinking is go on your way because it is impossible to partake of every single one that you meet. Well, some of them were just exhausted, some of them were broke, and some of them went back to England. But my main point here is that the African slave began to do that work. And the British had brought furniture from England, saw wood. There were termites in the West Indies who would eat that saw wood for dessert. <laughs> So they had to reproduce this furniture in the hard mahogany that was plentiful in the West Indies at that time, not plentiful at all now. So now you see the emergence of a craft class in the West Indies. You see the origin of the Caribbean free man. These people free, free with the question mark across began to engage in radical activity agitating against slavery, began to bring into being revolt after revolt until they had established a class of revolutionaries that the British could barely deal with. They had brought into being more successful revolution principally because they could maintain something in the Caribbean island that we could not maintain in the United States, and that was a culture continuity. The drone was not outlawed, and African religions 
problem not tolerated or not stringently outlawed. So they could communicate with each other based on the African religion, based on the drum language that went beyond the tonal language. So you had a guarded island of freedom in the Caribbean Island. Now, in the New England states of the United States, many blacks brought in as slaves because slavery was basically a New England business, and this is another lecture we need to, to give because most people think, oh, it much more. The South had most of the slaves, that slavery was a Southern business. Slavery was not a Southern business. The Northerners sold the slaves to the North, to the South. And when the Northerner underwrote the abolitionists, the South said, you a bunch of hypocrites, you sold me the slave, now you send these damn abolitionists around here to take the slave away. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't ever want to be on the side of defending the South. And when they call the Northerner a bunch of hypocrites, for selling them a slave and trying to take the same slave away from them, you pretend that they're so goody-goody, that now they were hypocrites, they still are hypocrites. Mm -hmm. on the same issue of the relationship of African Americans to the rest of the country. My main point here is that out of this free class came thinkers, people who could read, people who could write newspapers, came a class of Caribbean <coughs> who affected the intellectual wedding with a similar class in the United States. This is the origin of the 19th century radicalism in the Caribbean, in the 19th century radicalism in the United States. The same form of radicalism appeared in Africa in the almost physical radicalism in the anti-colonial war and the verbal radicals didn't appear in Africa in any great number until close to the end of the 19th century. And this was the missionary trained radical who began to appeal to the conscience of the Europeans, forget it, that a person who invades your country, rape your women, take your resources, have no conscience in the first place. Now, dealing with this contradiction in Africa, the colonial wall, where they went military to the field, at the end of the 19th century in Africa, in West Africa, they began to produce men like Case the Hayford, great logic, lawyers like John Mansa Sabah, a school of radicals coming out of Sierra Leone and out of the college called Fora Bay, now the University of Sierra Leone. In Nigeria, a series of radical missionary trade radicals who took them for their word. In East Africa, man, uh, John uh, Chalemwe, who uh, began the radicalism in the Asalan. John Chidemwe had gone to Overland. He had studied Christianity. He took up with an African, who was a black American, and John Lynch. They would go back to Africa, especially Christopher, in the Asalan, now Malawa. And they would ask the principal question of the missionary. I noticed you living in big houses and we're living in huts. If we're all children of the same God, then our living quarters should be equal. <laughs> now, if you move into the huts, that's all right. Or we move into the big house. So long as we children of God have the same living quarters. <laughs> if God gave you the right to have service, then I'm assuming that I have that right equal to yours. And not getting what he, the answers they wanted, they began to burn churches all the way into the Congo. 
grew. Near the end of that century, there appeared among them a strange thing that we have not dealt with, a white black nationalist. <laughs> John Booth. John Booth was from a distant dis element of Jehovah's Witness. He told Africans that the white man can't be trusted. <laughs> To his everlasting credit, when the Africans asked him could he be trusted, he said no. Chalemwe oh. <laughs> 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 and John Lynch brought off what is called the Niasaland Uprising. Black radicals fighting against the Germans after the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 5 was set in motion a series of revolutions. The best known, the Major Major revolt in what they call Tanzania. These Africans who go into battle, dashing themselves with what they call holy water that would deter a bullet. I'm not saying it did deter a bullet, but that's what they said. And they would dash themselves, water, water, major, major. And this is called the major revolt in Tanzania. In Southeast Africa, now Namibia, the Germans wanted to create a bastard race by cohabiting with the Herrera woman. The German did not know that the Herrera woman never cohabits outside of her group, not even with another African. See, while I'm talking about looseness and primitive and promiscuous in Africa, you quite forget that there were places in Africa where adultery could be punished by death. There are People in Africa who have trial marriages, sometimes three children before the actual marriage occurs with the approval of their respective families. There are also groups in Africa where the woman must bring virginity to her wedding bed. When you study the diversity of cultures in Africa, you will find many cultures using many different kinds of methods. But my focal point now is on the radicalness that appeared in Africa during that period. My main point is that at the end of the 19th and early 20th century, in Southern Africa, organizations that ultimately would lead to the finding of the first ANC, that the ANC faltered at first, Stimulated by the visit of Bishop Turner that we'll come to a little later, an African who became a cop out, John L. Dubé. And then he changed, he became such a cop out, being the first African to go to a, a university in Southern Africa, West Water Serac, still in existence, and to impress his wife. Us, he wrote a scholar's book called The Black Man is His Own Worst Enemy. Oh In order to atone for this later on, when someone showed him what a fool he was, <laughs> he went from village to village laying the foundation for the early ANC. The early ANC with no communists was a different organization that it had with the infusion of communists who may well be traitors to the ANC and who may well be informers to the South African white government. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You got to walk very carefully when someone else is carrying your coat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, at the end of this century, <coughs> now at Salandia, brought into being a large trade union movement. 
his name Clement Cadele. This was supreme radicalism to build a movement in southern Africa with a half a million member. Later on, Isaac Wallace would build a similar movement with a smaller number in Sierra Leone and parts of West Africa. A young radical, Casey Hayford, after the exiling of King Trempe and after the last Asante War led by a radical woman, Ye Asante War, Case the Hayford would start a demand for the return of the royal family and convert that demand into a demand for independence. When he died in 1931, he sent for his leading student trained to take his place, Joseph V. Dunqua. He sent for J.P. And he said, J.P., the mantle is yours. You do not know Africa as a custom of passing the mantle, choosing your successor before you die, and making sure that he's going to carry out the program you have designed and making sure that the people approve of the program and approve of him. All of this had been done before the death of Case the Hayford. But Case the Hayford, being the radical politician that he was, before this had found the Congress for British West Africa, bringing all the English speaking British together, and he had authored a book worth reading today. Ethiopia unbound, maybe Africa's first nationalist novel, but something else he had written, still worth reading today, is the truth about the West African land question. And he said that land could neither be bought or sold. It was the collective property of all of the people. Now, my main point is just to let you know that that was a universal radical activity in the African world, and that a Malcolm X who would emerge later to be the inheritance of this radical activity had not been born when it started. Now, back in the United States, the radicalism in New England was around the building of free institutions for blacks. Before the appearance of a Frederick Douglass, a young Barbadian, Prince Hall, had come to America on the eve of the American Revolution. And he saw the contradictions in the American Revolution. And he said that all this talk about freedom, what about us? At this time, West Indians or Caribbean people did not separate themselves from African Americans. But they knew what a whole lot of you seem to have forgotten, that the slave, one slave ship stopped in an island called Jamaica and these Africans became Jamaica. Another slave ship started in the island called Barbados, and these slaves became, these Africans become Barbados. Another slave ship later, 100 years later, stopped in the United States, and these Africans become, became America. That the slave ship did not bring any black Americans, didn't bring any Jamaicans, <laughs> didn't bring any AKAs, didn't bring any Delphians, didn't bring any Elks. Is bringing the yo low yellows or high yellows. <laughs> <laughs> All of this came as a result of the struggle to survive and people making compromised decisions in order to survive. Some they had to make, and some strategically they made 
for survival reasons. Now the Africa being remade away from home began to relate to a form of radicalism away from home. This first half of the 19th century needs to be looked at because this is the period of the massive slave revolts in the West Indies, the end of the nation of Palmeiras in Bahia and Brazil, where Africans had established an independent state before the American Revolution, the crushing of the Babish revolt in Guyana that started before the American Revolution. <laughs> You must understand all of these rebel activity that started among African people before the American Revolution, then you must look at the three revolutions in history that's best known to you, all phonies, all fakes. Mm -hmm. The French Revolution in its proclamation, the rights of man, did not change the lot of the French working class one iota. The starving of the Bastille, shown in so many movies and song and tribes, and you see Ronald Coleman starving the Bastille, <laughs> early old movies, if you're old enough, and nobody's here old enough to know this but me. The man named John Bowles starving the, Ma the Bastille. Well, the truth about the matter, all the nonsense about taking political prisoners out of the Bastille is pure nonsense. There were no political prisoners in the Bastille. <laughs> Seven people in the Bastille, two certified insane. <laughs> One of the whiskered Irishmen who thought that he was at least Jesus Christ, and on some days he condescended to be Julius Caesar. <laughs> two nuts and two bitch two roused out not even worth saying <laughs> but they have romanticized it and Dickens uh, broke tale of two cities kept quite a lot also and Ronald Coleman in jail this better thing, this is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. <laughs> <laughs> All of this movie fakery give you the illusion that a revolution occurs. The rights of man, a beautiful declaration, didn't help any French working class because the fight then was the maintenance of the slave system that helped everybody in France because some of the work filtered down to the lower classes. Building the ships, purification of the sugar, sorting the tobacco. So the slave system had 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 began to reconstruct and rescue the economy of Europe. Now the American Revolution, another fate, mm -hmm. was an argument between two levels of the English, old and new, and slave masters. The founding fathers were all slave masters. Some of the great heroes of the American Revolution were slave masters. And some of the heroes were not genuine heroes. Of course, Paul Revere made the right. He <laughs> might have made it for the reason you think he made it. But he was also a bootlegger warning other bootleggers hide the stuff before the British come up and attack them. He was right for that reason, too. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say he didn't serve his nation, <laughs> but he served his fellow bootleggers also. <laughs> a lazy critter, a good craftsman, good tin smith, but he was making more money selling the booze. <laughs> Why should he work all day 
<laughs> make it fast and fast. <laughs> we can sell a barrel of liquor <laughs> and run and get away with it. <laughs> now, my main point is that during this period of revolution, you've got to look at the radicalism of Prince Hall. And you look at the Masons of today who have no relationship to Prince Hall, and they should stop calling themselves Prince Hall Masons because they don't have any of the principles installed in this organization by the radical Prince Hall. They told him if you're a preacher, you get respect, he became a preacher. They told him he got no respect. They told him if you own property, you get respect. So he got, he owned property. Nothing changed. <laughs> They finally told me, you've got to have an organization. And he began an organization after the British refused to give him a charter, some Irish and some Scotch, though P with the British gave him an authentic charter. And what did he call this organization? The Mason, the Black Mason? No, he called it the African Lodge. And the first thing he established in relationship was, was a community school. Mm. Useful thing. Nineteenth <laughs> century early part of the 19th century, the massive slave revolt, Gabriel Prosser, 1800. Then Mark Beasy, 1822. Nat Turner, 1831. David Walker's appeal, and here we got to look at David Walker, because if you read David Walker's appeal and read Malcolm X's message to the grassroots, you will see a similarity. I'm saying, here you have an authentic forerunner of Malcolm West in David Walker and his famous appeal. You have a man setting in motion at a time when there were other blacks, some ministers, some not ministers, telling the African to compromise, the African in the United States to compromise. They walk with a lift up. Oh, he called for an armed struggle with the with the, the slaveholder. He called for the colored people of the world to rise up against the slaveholder. He had learned one thing that I personally will learn later on. Once you discover the unworthiness of people to rule you, your freedom began with this discovery. Right. <laughs> Now, in the midst of this, you have the finest example of a leader to emerge during this half, this first half of the 19th century, Frederick Douglass. Now, Frederick Douglass was not a perfect human being, and too many times we lack the ability to extract from human beings the good that they can do without expecting them to be perfect in every way. He became too much a trap, trapped by the Republican Party, but we'll talk about this later. The main thing is that a radical class of blacks did emerge in the appearance of <coughs> modern Delaney, <coughs> who went out to Nigeria, place called Abakuda, searching for a place for settlement. The argument over the American Colonization Society had occurred. Douglas was correct in pointing out that this society was ruled over by a bunch of whites who just wanted to get rid of blacks especially the black free man, because Douglas said that maybe the slave would like to trip a little better. Why are you sending 
these black abolitionists back to Africa, these free blacks back to Africa, instead of sending some slaves, freeing some slaves and sending them back to Africa? It was a good question, but the time was a good question for any time. Because that choice of who to go back told you that the, Af that the American colonization was a white scheme to get rid of black. It would prove itself more glaringly to be subversive in black interest during the period of Abraham Lincoln, and we'll just come to that fleetingly later on. But I'm saying that the first half of the 19th century, with the massive slave revolts, with the society, with, with, with that period, we can trace the radical antecedents of a Malcolm X. Using different words, men said different things. When the great minister, Henry Highland Garnett, had gone to Jamaica, <coughs> invited by the Jamaican free men, <coughs> we had heard that conditions in the United States had not changed. He thanked his Jamaican hosts and told them, told them, I am returning to the United States. I'm not returning to ask for integration because I do not want it. I am not returning to ask for justice because I do not expect it. I am returning to the United States to devote the rest of my life in trying to tear that republic down. <laughs> way anymore. We had to wait for a Malcolm X to emerge before someone said, either we be equal in the house or we don't care if the house stands. Then we have to tear the house down to get justice. Then this is as a consequence of the fight because we should pursue our freedom by any means necessary. necessary. And when he began to tell animal stories, Malcolm X was going back to the African methodology of teaching. When he was talking about the fox and the tiger, when Elijah Muhammad looked at the spectrum of white oppression and said, that man's a devil. Now, Elijah Muhammad understood something which we do not still understand. Whosoever is in charge of the hell in my life is my devil. Oh. Symbol of thief. Now, this is the way many Africans talk. So Malcolm X was not only in keeping with African folklore of teaching, he was in keeping with Caribbean folklore of teaching, he was in keeping with the world folklore of teaching. Because Africa illustrated stories by telling animal stories. Now let me tell you one to illustrate the point. It's a Nigerian story. An Igbo, <coughs> I mean, uh, told by the Igbo. A snake was riding down the road on a horse. And he saw a frog who shook his head in pity. He said, Mr. Snake, you don't know how to ride the horse. Let me show you. The snake got down and let him Y'all and show him how to ride the horse. And the snake got back on the horse and conceded that the frog could ride better. <laughs> then he looked arrogantly down at the frog, <clears throat> walking on the ground without any means of transportation, <laughs> and said, to know is one thing, <laughs> have is another. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Don't worry because I said the animals talk. Did you understand what I said the animals say? Yeah. <laughs> That's important. Because in Africa, you had talking animals. The African assumed that in as much as God had to make the waves and the ocean and the spring, they had some leaves and some other parts of the wood, he had to turn those brown. Well, on the other side of the wood, he had to turn those green. Well, on the side of the wood, one side of the wood, he had to start the planting season, and another, the rainy season. But maybe in his haste, he forgot to give the animals a voice. But the African gave him one. <laughs> So the African walked down the street and sees a crocodile and says, Mr. Crocodile, where are you going? <laughs> and the Africans began to tell stories of what the animals said. These were stories of wisdom. And these were il stories illustrating lessons in the period when there were very few books. Now, let me tell you another story that's so hectic and so old, if you don't know but one African story, I'm sure you might know this <laughs> How the spider got his small waistline. <laughs> 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 he was a chubby little fella, eating everything in sight. He heard there's going to be two banquets near each other. So he tied a string on his waist on the right and a string on the left to one friend now you wait over here and pull the string with this banquet star, and you pull the string with that banquet star. Now you've guessed the end of the story already because both banquet stars did the same time. <laughs> both friends did exactly what they were told to do and start pulling out the string, and that's how the spider got his small waistline. Now, African housewives tell this story to their children right now. You can eat as much as you want to, but don't be so greedy to eat everything. But why couldn't you just say it straight away? Then it wouldn't be the beauty of the poetry. Because mm -hmm. Africans would like to illustrate the lesson before they say the lesson. They like to spell out the lesson. And sometimes I remember my mother, who I love like a dear to even today, and she would look at me with her hand on her hip and say, mm -hmm. She didn't have to look the second time, because I knew that hand would come down <clears throat> in a place where it wasn't unwanted, and I would feel something. <laughs> and a warning was all I needed. So she had spoken without opening a mouth. So we began to, to speak in simple. Now, my main point, I want to let you know that Malcolm X's story about the fox and the wolves and the snakes in the grass comes out of old African tradition. And there are certain things that come down to us through time and space and everything else. Years ago, I accidentally met Ray Charles here in Chicago. I said, Mr. Charles, I believe the secret in your singing, what makes your singing so distinctive is that there is a protracted cry in your voice. These are the wailings of the slave ship coming down through the years, through the bloodstream, down through history. I meant exactly what I said. He said to someone, who is this crazy cat? I wish I could see it. <laughs> he did not understand that our culture was inherited. There are certain things that come down to us through time and history. And sometimes, when you don't have an answer, 
And you want to sound important while you're looking for the answer. And you want your listener to think you know the answer. You said this is genetical transference down from the veins. <laughs> now, after that, you got to look for the real answer. <laughs> but the, this answer holds your audience for a while and gives you the time to do some more study. Okay. My main point again is to relate Malcolm X and his stories and his teaching method. not only to ancient Africa, but to the teachings of the deity known as Jesus Christ. Now, how can I do this? Easy. Because very often, Malcolm X taught based on what was in front of him right then. He taught a lesson based on current reality. Now, to understand in Malcolm X, you have to understand this. Now, I have said in a previous place that in another time and place <coughs> and under other circumstances, a Malcolm X could have been a king and a good one. He could have made a nation and he could have destroyed a nation. That he was the finest example of leadership to emerge from the working class in black America in this century. Mm -hmm. And he was clearer on more issues and came directly to the heart of more issues than any man we have produced in this century. He did not have the time to intellectualize around this issue. That he came from the lower depths out of the Maya, and he learned from every step of the way things that he would apply later on. And what we need to look at is the circumstances in the United States that went into the making of his mind and the making <coughs> of his action and his ability to not compromise in a given situation once he had arrived at an explanation. Let's look at the death of his father, these early years, the mangled body of his father, thrown on the porch literally by members of the northern Ku Klux Klan, his mother growing slowly insane, the children being taken away, his early years in school when teachers discouraged him from aspiring to anything higher than that of a carpenter, planning suspicion in his mind about what he could be. Then, his gradual growth, never getting out of his mind, the fact that he grew up in a society that was programming him to be a servant of the society, other than to be a beneficiary of that society. <clears throat> coming to live in Boston, then coming to Harlem, he would become both the servant and the user of that society. He would become a pimp. He would become a user of dope and a seller of dope. He would become a waitress waiter and a hustler. He would become a petty gangster, a big red. Men would, again, one would, would fear him. He would go back to Boston where he would get arrested. And now 
we see after a while his making in the isolation of a jail is being introduced to Islam by his relatives, brother, his reading of the literature of Islam, his exercising discipline on himself by refusing to eat pork, his slow learning that became rapid learning, his ability to try to train himself with words, taking a dictionary and starting from A, which tells you a whole lot about misconceptions of education in the United States. His fascination for, the cons for Elijah Muhammad before he had even seen him. His final emergence from jail as a Muslim, heading a mosque in Detroit, becoming active in Chicago, marrying, coming to New York. And I would meet him in 1958 after my return from Africa. I was head of an exposition called the, the African Heritage Studies Exposition, the first exposition.